Obviously, post me too, we have all these wonderful conversations about boundaries and consent and how important it is and the effects on people when our consent is violated. And then uh, then there also seems to be this kind of boundary set, again, particularly for cis men around no means no, and we're really strengthening those boundaries, which is great. But some of the things I've heard around rejection, so for example, particularly for blokes, and I don't think this should be gendered because rejection is hard for everyone, but something mm. like, oh, you know, if a woman rejects you, you just have to suck it up, mate. Like just deal with it because you have to respect her boundaries. And the second bit is true. You have to respect, we need to respect each other's nose. It's so important. But I don't believe in the just sucking it up. I think that rejection does hurt. It's just normal for rejection to hurt. And rejection is a normal part of, uh, of life and of dating and of having sex. And I think we need to start teaching people to manage their emotions better. And we can't teach them to manage rejection better if we're telling them just to suck it up. I'm Cindy Darnell and welcome to The Erotic Philosopher, the podcast where we examine and explore sex and relationships through social, cultural, political and other lenses and find some ways to explore some very diverse erotic quandaries. Today's guest on The Erotic Philosopher is Georgie Wolfe, a Melbourne, Australia based sex educator and sex worker. Starting out in Sydney's kink scene at the age of 19, her many adventures have included being a kink club photographer, photoshopping sex toys for the covers of porn catalogues, working as an independent escort and running consent-focused sex and dating workshops. Her writing work has been published by the Sydney Morning Herald, The Guardian and Archer magazine, among others. She's the author of The Art of the Hookup, a straightforward guide to ethical casual sex and produces a podcast of the same name. Today's conversation with Georgie Wolf takes a really deep dive into the intricacies of hookups, casual sex, erections, and rejection. Georgie Wolf, welcome to The Erotic Philosopher. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really, really excited about speaking with you, Cindy. It's been so long, and I can't wait to have a really great chat. Me too. And since the last time we were both together in Melbourne, you've written an extraordinary book, uh, which sort of piggybacks on your experience, not only as a sex worker, but also somebody who enjoys sex, who has sex, and really who loves it. The book, of course, is called The Art of the Hookup. Um, and I, th to my knowledge, it's the first book of its kind that really explains to people how to have casual sex and really enjoy it. What inspired you to write this book? Things really escalated quite quickly. I was literally out on my morning jog one morning and I was thinking, why hasn't anybody written a book about sex that's that's about casual sex? Because a lot, I feel like a lot of our sex education often mm. is really focused on couples um, because that's the most socially acceptable way to talk about sex in the context of our marriage or, or in more recent times right. in the context of a committed relationship. Not many people like to talk about how they had a really good route on the weekend. That's Australian vernacular, by the way, sorry. <laughs> and and look, <laughs> <laughs> Root in Australian means to have penis in vagina sex. <laughs> Which is highly unfortunate if you're uh, talking about your footy team in the US and you say you're rooting for someone. Don't come to Australia and say that. People People will look at you funny um, but look I was just thinking <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about my experiences because I've always had a lot of casual sex um, and thinking about how they've changed since I've become a sex worker and basically what what seems to have happened over the years I've been a sex worker for maybe about 10 years now and uh, look I found that as I became more comfortable with my work and as I learned the skills that are required to be a really good sex worker, all those communication skills and all those sex skills, that my personal sex life just started yeah. getting so much better. It really made a big difference. And then one day it just clicked and I thought, hang on, I know this, I know things now that have made a difference to my sex life. Why don't other people know these things? Why don't we teach those things? And why don't right. we teach them in the context of casual right. sex and hookups why do we only teach sex skills in the context yeah. of relationships yeah and so i just think you know something that you're saying about how your experience of being a sex worker enhanced your knowledge of sex and enhanced your capacity to be able to negotiate sex because certainly doing sex work you're in almost a constant state of negotiation with new clients or, or you know ex even pre-existing clients, each encounter requires 
a new discussion about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And it's it's always baffled me how sex workers and the knowledge that sex workers hold and, and embody is often omitted from so many, you know, professional health organizations and professional sexuality organizations that when we talk about the world's mm. oldest profession being sex work, you know, to, to my mind, and I'm sure to you and many of the people who uh, are listening to this podcast, to understand that sex workers provide such an incredibly integral service, especially when it comes to sex education. So mm. when you, when the book was released, Georgie, and I know that you're sort of in, you're bringing in stories or, you know, information rather from your professional endeavors and your private endeavors and fusing them together. How has the response been to the fact that you've been out as a sex worker and that you're using your sex work skills to actually be foundational platforms to give education to people about how to actually have sex that's that's respectful and enjoyable? To be honest, I was prepared for quite a big backlash because we do certainly um, mm -hmm. often have this still this very outdated view of sex work that it's a a low skill profession that it's just about uh, being promiscuous and just mm. lying back and letting other people do things to you that sex work doesn't require mm. skill but of course having done this for a long time I know that sex work is a skilled profession it takes a lot of negotiation as, you, as you've said a lot of knowledge around safer sex we're basically holding space for other people. So a lot of psychological skills, it's not just taking yeah. some money and then spreading your legs, which I think is the general um, sort of assumption among regular people. Right. It's just so much more nuanced. The, the depth of emotional sensitivity that sex workers have to have to be able to really hold the vulnerabilities mm. of their clients is really above and beyond I think what a lot of psychotherapists are even capable of doing. It's quite heavy and in fact I have I am on a bit of a campaign to try and help uh, sex work clients distinguish and help workers distinguish uh, between times when we can offer emotional labor and times when we need to send our clients to counselors uh, because I find that certainly sex oh. work clients often do come to sex workers for um, for a lot of therapy that they should be seeing professionals for because, you know, yeah. our culture teaches men right. that the only place they're going to get emotional support is from the people they're fucking. So that's a really common thing. So right. I, I, I fully expected people to say, are you crazy? Like, why would a, you know, why would a hooker be giving sex advice? All you do is just lie there and take it. I, I really expected someone to come back at me and say that. But what actually happened yeah. is a lot of people yeah. came to me and said, thank you so much. I really needed this. Or I had no confidence to go out there and get yeah. laid. And now I do. There was almost no uh, judgment and there was almost no uh, sort of incredulity about my credentials. It was actually pretty cool. That's really, I'm really, really glad to hear that. And certainly for folks who are listening, I would encourage you to get a copy of The Art of the Hookup and read it for yourself to see just how in-depth this book is and and how affirming and generous Georgie is with her knowledge in, in this context. So, Georgie, who is the book for? Like, who's the ideal readership for this book? To be honest... Um, it is look. It's non-gendered, so it's a it's it's written for people of all genders and ages. It's supposed to be inclusive and in all sexual orientations. But when I wrote it, I was thinking um, of cis straight men, because to be honest, sometimes I kind of right. feel this is a tricky thing to say, but I kind of feel like a lot of sex education is very privileged, and it only reaches the privileged in terms of the people who have access to. Uh, to queer culture and to kink culture. Yeah, the people who have access to inclusive social groups where they can talk about sex. But the majority of people out there, and especially Aussies, as we've talked about before, they're pretty locked down when it comes to talking about sex. You can't go to your mate and ask them a question when you're stuck. And I kind of feel like there's not much, there's not much for people around that. I really agree. I mean, I've seen in all the years I've been doing this work, the, the cohort that struggle most with sex in particular, as opposed to uh, identity and belonging, the cohort that I've seen that struggle most with sex is uh, straight men. They really, Agreed. really struggle. And this is something that, you know, even in my end of the profession around, you know, counselling and sex therapy, there are very few straight men 
in this profession and it this is this is really indicative of how how much I think straight men struggle with this so I and I think it's changing um and this is not to say you know that this is a pity party for straight men as such mm. but there is there really is a lack of useful information for straight men about how to negotiate sex with straight women um and who better to get it from than sex workers who service straight male clients? So again, I really, <laughs> I really applaud you for doing this. So Georgie, let's jump into some of the common mistakes that straight men make, or people, let's say people, uh, with hookups and casual sex. Yeah, look, I do believe that we all suffer from these problems to a greater or lesser degree. Um, and I think the the single biggest issue that, again, we still haven't solved, even though it's the 21st century, is feeling like we should just know. We should just magically know. Uh, if you're a dude, you should yeah. magically know how to talk to women. If you're a straight dude, um, if you're a straight chick, you should magically know how to talk to guys. Uh, if you have sex, you should just magically know how to have sex. And if you don't, it means there's something wrong with you. It means you're deficient as a person. This is a really persistent myth. Yeah. No matter how often, how much we talk about this, how much we go, guys, how are you supposed to, you don't know how to ride a bike, so how the hell are you supposed to know how to have sex the first time or the second or the tenth or the hundredth? And so in terms of, you know, the mistakes that people make being based on the fact that they don't know stuff and that this information is not magically downloaded, the things that you see either, you know, cl that clients have done or that, you, you know, dudes that you've had hookups with where you have either had to school them or or things that you have negotiated perhaps in your you know text prior to meeting um, that have helped you manage and avoid some of these mistakes I know that as sex educators we're always talking about communication 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 but honestly I think just yeah. um, actually just talking about some of this stuff often breaks down those barriers so I, I, I'm a bit of a sadist, so I love doing this. I love getting on Tinder. I love picking up um, a straight cis guy who has never had any sort of sex education and then just communicating, just saying, hey, so this is a hookup, right? Like this is a one night stand. We're not going to see each other again. And they're just not prepared for that conversation. We're not trained to actually talk about the fact that yeah. we're about to have sex. We're not trained to talk about the fact that we're going to have sex and then, you know, not date. Um, and it's just, I feel like modeling behavior is sometimes the best way to actually show people that it works. We can talk about this stuff in theory, but often it never really lands, mm. I find, for people until they actually see it and then something clicks. Yeah. I mean, that's been an experience too that I've had, you know, over the years of my own escapades with casual sex. And again, saying to men in particular, you know, I want us to talk about sex before we do it. And often you know how confronted they were I guess with having a woman being so upfront mm. about what I'm hoping for and what I'm expecting and then sometimes getting a little bit of not pushback right. but just I think more they're just stunned they just don't know what to do with it and then <laughs> when I have to you know when I lead and demonstrate and model and then they kind of go oh okay and they feel a bit awkward and they're still sort of like, I don't really want to do this, but they go along with it anyway, you know, because I insist basically. And then <laughs> inevitably the sex always ends up better for me at mm. least. And they say that it ends up better for them too because there's none of this hoping and wishing that they're going to do something that I'm not going to say, oh, I want this. Mm. It's, it's for me in my, you know, mature years. It's much easier to just say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Are you up for it or not? Oh. There's something about experiential sort of stuff that just seems to work and seems to endure much more than pointing out the logic of something, much more than arguing with someone that they should change mm. the way that they're doing things. It, once it lands in a physical way or once there's that good sexual experience attached, it really tends to stick much, much better. Um, and this is what I like to call people mm. hacking, but what, what I imagine everyone else probably calls therapy. <laughs> So it's kind of, uh, you know, yeah. finding finding the ways to change people around this really personal, very, we're often very stuck in our sexuality. It's one of the last things we want to let go of and the last things we want to change. It's terrifying to do things differently in the bedroom and finding ways to get people unstuck. I mean, that's that's a life's work, as you would know. 
Yeah, absolutely. The, I've just been reading through the book again before we got onto this call to have this discussion. And the chapter that I was last reading was included something around the delicate nature of rejection. And I think that that's one of the things that can make negotiating sex difficult in a casual context and even mm. actually in a partnered context, being able to turn down an offer. And whether the offer is, you know, do you want to hook up or in a in a longer term relationship, do you want to try this? Do you want to have a threesome? Do you want to have anal? Do you want to, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. That negotiating rejection, I mean, mm -hmm. it's never easy for anybody. So what were some of your guides and tips around how to manage rejection in a mature and confident way? This is actually one of my biggest um, issues with some of the ways that we handle sex education currently around consent because I mean okay. obviously post me too we have all these wonderful conversations about boundaries and consent and how important it is and the effects on people when our consent is violated and then uh, then there also seems to be this kind of boundary set, again, particularly for cis men around no means no, and we're really strengthening those boundaries, which is great. But some of the things I've heard around rejection, so for example, particularly for blokes, and I don't think this should be gendered because rejection is hard for everyone, but something yeah. like, oh, you know, if a woman rejects you, you just have to suck it up, mate. Like just deal with it because you have to respect her right. boundaries. And the second bit is true. You have to respect, we need to respect each other's nose. It's so important. But I don't believe in the just sucking it up. I think that rejection does hurt. It's just normal for rejection to hurt. And rejection is a normal yeah. part of, uh, of life and of dating and of having sex. And I think we need to start teaching people to manage their emotions better. And we can't teach them to manage rejection better if we're telling them just to suck it up and as you'd know because uh because you're from australia we have this very stoic kind of um mm. machismo kind of culture very stoic. right i've talked about this on a few I episodes know. it's it's really strong so we have this kind of suck suck it up mate culture anyway which aligns really well with the a woman's rejected you so just suck it up bro sort of thing which means that right. all that happens is that someone who's been rejected feels like they need to push down their feelings of pain and push down their reaction to the rejection and we all know what happens when we repress our difficult feelings right they come out in very pro problematic ways i think we should yeah. We need to be teaching people that rejection, firstly, that it happens and it's inevitable. Secondly, yeah. that it does suck and that you need to sit yeah. sit with your feelings and learn to learn to process those difficult emotions a little bit better. And I think that's the step yeah. that's maybe missing in our current consent culture stuff, that we need to right. set those boundaries. We need to make it very clear that consent is absolutely something that should be respected above all else. But then we also need to give people the emotional skills to handle those boundaries. Otherwise, they're not, yeah. they're not going to adopt that behavior. Right. I agree. And I think, I mean, over the years that consent culture has shifted and it's still got a long way to go mm. but my own observations of observing how it is developing and i don't know how it's going in australia georgie i'd be curious to hear what's happened there in the last couple of years but what i've been observing um in the us and and also especially coming out of the uk around consent is that conversations of yes and no are just really not enough mm. and that we have to learn to get uncomfortable we have to learn to get specific we have to learn how to if we're going to say no to something especially if it's with somebody that we like mm. and we actually do want to continue to have some sort of connection with whether it's casual or permanent or whatever and even you know with friendships frankly learning how to say no and then just leaving it at that is one thing and and that's useful mm -hmm. but i also think it's helpful for folks to start getting into the habit of saying, I'm going to say no to that, but how about this and offering up a, an alternative mm. of I would like this, this is actually what I really want, rather than just a flat out no sometimes, unless of course it is a flat out no, that we can start to explore the nuance of how we want to engage sexually, which for a lot of us means having to get comfortable with saying yes and so much consent mm. culture doesn't actually teach especially doesn't teach women to talk about the nitty-gritty of how they want to be fucked yep and when we don't have that language 
it's we're going to fall back on the very very basics yeah i um, i'm quite a fan of for saying thank you for asking yes. so look no i'm not down for that but thank you for asking it takes a lot of courage to ask i really appreciate it and the same for yeah. hearing a no saying look thanks for saying no i really appreciate you being honest with me and it just reframes that whole situation from one of failure and rejection to one of, uh, you know, having a constructive conversation. We are actually being honest with each other. And, you yeah. know, this is not filtering down. So I can certainly say that from my experiences on online dating and my friends' experiences and the young people that I talk to, this kind of stuff is it's not getting to them. Yeah, it's really not. And I see too because... You know, this again, this, you know, focus on consent culture among young people, which is important. And then there's also people in their 30s, 40s, 50s Mm -hmm. who are separating from long term partners, they're swiping, or, you know, they're having affairs, they're cheating, or they're people who are in open relationships Mm -hmm. um, and they're consensually having multiple relationships and seeking out multiple partners. So this is really something that affects people across a multitude of generations. And while the youngsters have grown up hearing the word consent and it's part of their vernacular and and there's a familiarity with the concept of consent at least, Mm. for folks kind of over 35, 40, it seems to be consent is something that young people do. And Ooh. what I love about what you're talking about in the book is that consent is actually something that makes sex hot. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, well, I don't understand why we haven't done this reframe earlier. When we frame consent as a moral problem, it's a bit yeah. like framing recycling as a moral problem. You know, you should you should put your containers in the recycling bin or you're a bad person. It really doesn't work that well. But to reframe consent rather than to say, if you don't do consent, you're a bad person. And there's a lot of problems with that particular stance to say, look, when you do consent, you can have amazing sex. And it's true. I don't understand why we haven't publicized that a little more because it's kind of important. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I mean, it just seems to be like a collective kind of, in America, I think it's like a prudishness. There's just sort of an ick factor with talking about sex because of, you know, what exists here that doesn't exist in Australia mm. is this notion of purity. Mm-hmm. And living here for the last few years as I have, I've been increasingly aware of just how powerful purity culture is here, which is, uh, you know, this concept that, especially for women, that sexuality is is sacred, not in a tantric sort of way, but in a, <laughs> in a you know, you got to save it for the right person sort of oh. way, which, you know, for people listening who are into that, you know, all power to you, but for the majority of people who are not into that, this notion of purity sort of sets up this binary of black and white thinking that if you have sex and you're dirty and and I didn't realize how powerful that was in the US until mm. I've I've been immersed in it and actually working with clients who've grown up in that culture as opposed to Australia uh, and the UK where it's a bit more the problem is not so much purity it's stoicism it's just a complete inability to to have a brash conversation about sexual pleasure in particular so it's kind of maybe understandable in America, at least, why we might frame consent as a moral issue because it's more comfortable to talk about right. um, in the context of, of purit- puritanicalism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Whereas um, to talk about pleasure and wanting more pleasure from your sex and using consent to do that might actually feel transgressive. And I think, I mean, that's the thing about, you know, talking about pleasure in general and when it comes back to the body, because again, we can talk about pleasure in the context of sports, but we struggle to talk about pleasure in the context of sex mm-hmm. because of the ick factor and the our capacity to, to actually be with the discomfort of what sex brings up for us and the fact that a lot of us just don't know, going back to what you said, because we just have, we've never learned. And this is the crucial thing, I think, about adult sex education. Mm, absolutely agree. The, the the stuff to unpack there is very much, it's very much knowing how to be, um, be around your own uncomfortable emotions and yeah. also just acknowledging the lack of privilege that a lot of people have that they just do not have access to yeah. good sex education, particularly where you are. But I kind of feel like in Australia too, we don't have good supports. Most people can't talk about sex and can't immediately find good sources. So when yeah. you throw all that in the mix, uh, unpicking this problem starts to look kind of impossible. And one of the other things, Georgie, that you mentioned in the book that really stood out to me was you talk about developing dating confidence. 
and you sort of talk about how it's something that you've learned over the years to to really embody that it's not just a front it's not just something you put on you're actually living it 24 7 mm-hmm. could you talk us through your you know a, a condensed version of your journey into sexual confidence because I think it's really something a lot of people struggle with and I know I learned it from my own experiences of you know working in a professional context and also through just having lots of dates how did you learn to develop sexual confidence i had a very interesting and bumpy ride through this because i've always been really interested in sex and i know this is something that a lot of sex educators say that they just had this fascination and i have a fascination with just people how do people work and one of the most one of the quickest ways to find out how someone ticks is via their sexuality it's one of the places where we have the most complexity and the most difficulties and it is very personal so i'd always been really interested um when i was 19 i started hanging out in the leather scene in Sydney so this was quite quite some time ago and I was immediately exposed to this huge variety and this huge spectrum of human sexuality from kinksters to queer people and trans people and swingers all that sort of thing and it was just this amazing education so I feel like I became desensitized to that kind of uh, you know sex shame people that Uh, people that learn that they love kink or people that learn that perhaps they might be uh, bi-curious or that might learn that they're gay or or later in life. I feel like there's this very much this sticking toe in the water and then pulling back and being fearful of where this journey might take you kind of feeling. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah. Whereas I just fell straight in the deep end of kink at the age of 19, completely immersed in it. And from then on, I wasn't scared of sex, but I certainly was still very inequipped emotionally maturity wise to handle this stuff so then Mm. uh, after that experience for the next decade i basically just bounced around wreaking absolute havoc and i had some amazing (laughs) adventures but i i did some terrible things and and you you'll know from the book i detail some of those terrible things that i've done and some of the ways i've treated people and and some of it was because i was young and i didn't really care some of it was because i thought it was casual sex and of course you just treat your partners badly because it's casual who cares so a lot of that kind of um, feeling and, and and lacking social skills. So just deciding to not bother with consent because it seemed too hard. And I know that's a very common experience. You know, for folks listening, we're not, it's not about shaming people who make mm. mistakes. Goodness knows we've all made mistakes, but how we get ourselves on the right track is in recognizing that the way that we've maybe tried things before or stuff that we've done hasn't worked and committing to doing it differently. And the good news, you know, I think, is that the information is out there now, especially online and in your book. More than anything, I think it's the struggle is around integration. How do we integrate what we learn? And so when you say that you were immersed in this scene in, in Sydney when you were much younger around people who were doing stuff that you weren't necessarily into yourself, but I think surrounding yourself by people who know more than you who are different than you who who are really knowledgeable in particular areas of sex is is a really great way to learn community is a great way to learn and that's a hard thing to say because i understand that some people just don't have access if you're not queer you don't have access to the queer community if you're not kinky you don't have access uh but even having supportive friends where you can talk about each other's sex lives you know a lot of people don't have it and don't know how to get it started and certainly i didn't so like i think I, I was exposed to a lot of different things and there was a lot of enthusiasm for sex and one would say sex positivity but there was still there was something missing and that was those skills, those emotional skills and those consent right. and boundary skills. So right. I, I still kind of feel like being being exposed to all the things that are possible without also being exposed to the consent prax- practices and communication practices that we need to do this stuff safely can, can leave you in a bit of a vulnerable situation also. Yeah that they need to come together. You know, what we're both saying, of course, is that none of this is easy. And I guess that's Mm. what, by definition, makes it hard. But (laughs) it's really crucial. And, you know, people listening to this podcast who have an interest in sex, I presume that's why you listen, (laughs) um, (laughs) you know, if you find this kind of stuff difficult, welcome. Like that means that you're trying, you know. If you're breezing through this going, yeah, yeah, no problems, you're missing something. Because this shit's hard. It it's, should be it's, challenging. It is hard. It should be, exactly, exactly. And speaking of challenging, Georgie, I've got a letter for you 
Are you ready? Oh, great. Yes, I'd love to hear it. All right. Dear philosophers, hoping you can settle a debate for me. I'm a 32-year-old, sorry, 32-year-old straight guy who's had a ton of casual sex with women, and we've both had a great time. But one of my friends, female, told me that she never comes during hookups. And I told her that's weird because the women I hook up with do. She said that's not true and showed me some data to confirm that women don't have orgasms in casual sex. So the question is, are the women I'm hooking up with lying about coming with me like my friend is saying or not? I'm keen to please, but why would they lie about it? I don't understand this. And this is from Steve, Georgie. Do you have any words for Steve? Oh, Steve, there's a lot to unpack here for sure. Yeah. yeah. What a tricky situation to be in. Mm-hmm. And I can, hearing you reading that, the sense I'm getting of that is one of frustration and yeah. maybe insecurity. Mm-hmm. You know, what if all these women that I thought I was pleasing, they were just lying to me? That would be devastating. Yeah. Um, but also there's a couple of little things coming through in that in that message that I'd like to question. And the the first one is maybe Steve's assumption that just because someone didn't come that they were out and out lying. I'm curious to know whether he asks the women he's sleeping with whether they came and they say, yes, yes, I definitely came, or whether he's Mm. just perhaps making some assumptions based on how they're behaving or the noises they're making at particular times Mm. and thinking maybe that they have come. I'd love to know which is which because I guess there's a big difference between assuming someone has come or having them tell you afterwards that you're amazing and that they definitely came but then finding out they lied to you. That would be a tough situation. Right, yeah. But, of course, we all know the orgasm gap exists, right, that this is a thing. Yeah, this Um, is definitely a thing, yeah. And, in fact, I'm kind of put in mind of the book Faking It by Lux Ultram. I don't know if you've read it, but it talks about some of the reasons that women might lie about sex. And of course, one of them is faking orgasms and the reasons that some women might fake their orgasm. And there are so many reasons to unpack there, but very few of them have to do with the partner was terrible and they're a terrible person, which seems to sort of feel like what Steve might be afraid of, that if all these women were lying to him, it means he's not a good lover. Yeah, right. And so this year you've brought up such important stuff here. And like when I read this letter, I was thinking, you know, firstly, good on, you know, his friend for for explaining to him that women, you know, don't always have orgasms in casual sex and that this is a problem. So that's the first part. So friend, if you're listening, good on you. Um, (laughs) And the second part too is also I think that, you know, and this is for women in casual sex, what, you know, what they want to get out of it. Do they expect to have an orgasm? Do they want to have an orgasm? And if they do want to, you know, are they open to telling the men that they're hooking up with what kinds of things makes them come, if that is actually what they're looking for? Mm. And if it's not what they're looking for, to be able to say, you know what, I didn't come, but that's actually not what I was looking for. What I was looking for was, you know, if de- and again, depending on what you're doing, is it, you know, are they doing a power exchange scene? Then mm. orgasm's probably not the intention. They want they get off on some other kind of engagement some other kind of interaction so I think really context matters and the type of sex that people are having if it is just defaulting to penis in vagina sex Mm. because that's what you're supposed to do when there's one penis and one vagina in the same bed at the same (laughs) time as opposed to really talking about pleasure and what really turns people on because I know in conversations that I've had with straight men also personally and professionally a lot of women who are defaulting to to blowjobs and expecting that penis and vagina sex is going to happen and you know newsflash a lot of straight men don't like blowjobs yes that is a thing that happens. I kind of feel like this is this is uh, something that I call the sex escalator or the sex escalator. And it's a little bit like the relationship escalator in that we have assumptions about how a relationship should go, the stages and where it should end up. And I think we have assumptions about how heterosex should go and where it should end up. And it's, it's particularly in casual encounters, we just default back to that script. Yeah. We just assume. And a part of that assumption is that orgasm is the most important thing. Yeah. So assuming that if if the guy doesn't come or the girl doesn't come, that it's not good sex. And so there's a lot of pressure on everyone to come in the first place right. and a lot of defocusing on all the other things that actually make sex 
good. So yeah. hence Steve's sort of, you know, there might be a little bit of fixation on um, making his partners come because that's how he knows that he's done a good job yeah. as opposed to looking at all the other things that make sex great or just being able to actually ask, how is that for you? What did you like about that? Right. Without needing to rely on that orgasm signifier that to tick that box, you know. Yeah. And to really just expand the definition of sex and pleasure and again mm. particularly for and this i think applies to gay men as well as straight men the pressure to have erections you know that you have to have oh erections God, for yes. sex to be good and when i say to straight men or you know gay men as well you can still have pleasure without an erection they look at me like i'm insane because it's just like what mm. You know, it and this counter to everything they've been taught, which right. is just terrible. Concept of being able to have sex and receive touch in particular when you're soft, I think, to a lot of men. Oh, the, yeah. the pressure to be hard because the vulnerability of being not only witnessed when you're soft, but also held and touched when you're mm. soft is, is just, it seems to be too much for a lot of straight men and gay men to bear until they start to develop their emotional muscles where mm. they can really start to expand sex, even in a casual context, even in a hookup, to be able to say, you know, I can go deep with you, I can really open up my soul to you, as it were, and even if we're not going to have a long-term relationship, in fact, sometimes sex is better outside mm. of long-term relationships because... You don't have to. You don't have to pretend so much that you can bring more of yourself to the exchange, and it's really something that I I really wish a lot of penis owning dudes would understand is that it's just not all about the D. I wish everyone did actually, and yeah. I wish that everyone understood that they could bring that emotional register to yeah. sex, regardless of whether it's relationship sex or hookup sex. And yeah. certainly just for, just to add that perspective too, I do know a lot of men that have been shamed by straight women for not getting hard. Absolutely as though, true. Yes, as though that that's... was the only thing about them that mattered, which is yeah. crushing and ter terrible. Yeah. Um, but honestly, bringing, bringing your emotions and wanting to be held and wanting intimate contact that's not just about the dick um, during casual encounters is, is such a big part of it. It yeah. seems such a shame to miss those parts just because we think we should just be fucking. And I think that, you know, that goes back to the sex education piece about these women expecting that the only way a man can show that he's interested in her is with the presence of his erect penis. Mm. And it, 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 again, I mean, it re really reduces men's sexuality down to just being, you know, these machines that you put a coin in the slot and they're ready to go. And I know, again, from the conversations I've had with straight men um, and gay men, you know, through my professional services, that that pressure to perform is, is really... It, breaks a lot of them and being reduced down to one one body part or one aspect of yourself as someone who was raised female presenting i know that it's it's dehumanizing and it feels terrible to be reduced down to just my body or just my genitalia so of course i wouldn't want to do that to anyone regardless of their gender and it is a a, a terrible thing to happen to anyone regardless of their gender Georgie, we have to wrap this conversation up now. I've just loved talking to you today. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. This has been a wonderful way to start the day. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, where we're doing this on opposite sides of the world. It's <laughs> going into my evening here in New York City and Georgie's in Australia, just getting her day started. Um, I'm going to put the links to your book in the show notes. And um, I'm also going to apologize to folks listening <laughs> for the sound that's going on out here. Where I am is on a noisy street and I'm going to try and edit some of this out, but most of it is going to stay. So apologies for the noises <laughs> in the background, folks. You know, that's what happens when you have gritty podcasts. That's life. Georgie, thanks again. And I'd love to have you back on as a guest another time i would love to this has been thoroughly enjoyable thanks so much cindy hello listeners i hope you enjoyed this thought-provoking conversation with georgie wolf be sure to check out the links in the show notes for access to georgie's sites and also the book 
The Art of the Hookup. If you're enjoying The Erotic Philosopher, why don't you give us a follow on social media at The Erotic Philos, P-H-I-L-O-S, on Instagram and Twitter. You can leave a quandary for The Erotic Philosophers to ponder heading over to my website, cindydarnell.com, C-Y-N-D-I-D-A-R-N-E-L-L.com. Select the podcast tab and you'll see a link there to send in your quandary. While you're there, check out the suite of online classes that I offer in my online pleasure school, including an upcoming class specifically for men, penis owners, erection havers on how to manage sex with unreliable erections and unreliable ejaculation. Thanks for listening.